Sometimes I've been asked why MIT PhDs in finance and economics do so well in research on average, or typically. And I always answer that question with another question. Why is it that the French have such excellent food? And the answer is that they know what excellent food tastes like. So the, thing, the same thing applies to people who come here. Uh, a doctoral student who comes and starts at MIT is immersed in good research and good ideas. And if they survive, they absorb it, they learn what excellent research is, and they aspire to do it themselves. And without that marination, I'll call it, if you think of a piece, piece of meat marinating in something, Without it having the doctoral students marinating in this atmosphere of excellent research, they wouldn't develop the understanding of what excellent research is. And without that, they couldn't do it themselves. Now, I know that's a sort of silly analogy to cuisine and gastronomy, but I really think it's true. And for uh, a young assistant professor who came from Stanford in 1966, and was immersed in MIT's intellectual environment, it was much the same. It was just wonderful. I got to respond to Franco's questions when he slowed down, or when, he was, when, he, when I could catch him. I got long talks with Paul Kuttner, who, who was extremely bright and good and influential in those early days. We tend to forget him because he moved away from MIT and then sadly died from a heart attack at a very young age. We have a wonderful colleague. And then uh, with just a little bit of a delay, there's the group of Bob, me, Fisher, Myron, who managed to run the finance group without adult supervision. <laughs> and being a part of that group, was just wonderful because the ideas were always, always circulating and something new would happen every day or every week. Um, it's, no, it's no slight to you, Bob, to say that I especially enjoyed not only talking to you, but to Fisher Black, whom he and I had a lot of joint interests, or Myron, or others. It was just wonderful. And, um, so if you fast forward to 1975, I was trying to figure out why it is that growth companies borrow much less than mature companies. And I remember sitting, I was over at the London Business School at the time, I remember sitting there, and finally the light bulb went off and said, wait a minute, uh, those growth opportunities the, the, are really investment opportunities, and the investment opportunities are options, they're what we now call real options, and you've got to analyze and think, think through them that way. And then, of course, the idea came up, wait a minute, there's also put options, which account for default. And once you've got those options operating, to some extent, uh, against each other, there's a phenomenon that comes along called debt overhang. And the immediate conclusion is that since you can't contract debt overhang away, for reasons we could go into, uh, the smart thing for growth companies to do is to borrow less so that the debt overhang never comes up in the first place. So this whole area of real options, would that have come about in the same way or at the same time if I would not been at MIT, if I didn't have people like Bob to talk to? I don't know, maybe but it might have come later, it might have come in a fuzzier and not as clear fashion. But I'm happy to credit it to MIT and to people like Bob. You know, my, my co-author Dick Brealy in the textbook once gave me a joke and a compliment all in one. He said, Stuart, you're a bottomless pit of ideas. And I'll repeat it for you, Bob, you're a bottomless pit of, inspira of intellectual inspiration. <laughs> So anyway, now here we are, a uh, long time since, and my co-author Jamie Reed and I uh, realized that after, what was it, 40 years since real options have 
was identified. I didn't invent them, I just pointed them out. There was a hole in how real options are valued in practice. I should say, not, a, not maybe not a hole, but an inconsistency. Because corporate finance has, corporate finance practice and theory, has well-developed methods for valuing real assets, a factory or a truck or a computer system, whatever it is. And those uh, methods take care to think about the debt capacity of the asset that you're buying. They take care to think about taxes. And the taxes that are avoided if the, the uh, real asset supports debt. Now, if you look over at the extensive literature on the valuation of real options, there's no mention of debt capacity. There's no mention of taxes except, of course, due to after-tax cash flows, but not the consequences of the tax consequences of taking a, of exercising a real option or holding a real option. What are the consequences of that on the firm's capital structure or in the taxes you might save on, or might incur because you can borrow less against an asset because of the option leverage. All of that is wrapped up in this paper, which is coming out in the um, Critical Finance Review soon. I think it was supposed to be out, but there was some delay. By the way, my co-author, Jamie Reed, is there. Can you wave? Um, it was Jamie that pushed this paper because he kept saying, Stuart, how do we, how do we handle the debt consequences of, of taking on an option or holding an option. And I said, oh, I don't know. And then finally, we figured it out. OK? So that's what I'm going to go through. OK. Three questions. One, how does the after-tax value of a real option calculate it? Second, what's the debt capacity of a real option? That is, what are, what, what are the effects of holding a real option on the firm's uh, financing. And third, uh, what does the trade-off theory predict for the capital structure of a corporation holding real options? And I'll give you a preview there. It's really pretty simple. Options have leverage in them. And in a world of rational valuation, off-balance sheet leverage, as option leverage is, it counts the same as on-balance sheet leverage. Yet we only see on-balance sheet leverage and if the firm is rational and takes account of the off-balance sheet leverage, we're going to see things in observed capital structures that look funny. Or maybe they don't look funny, but they don't look simple. Let's put it that way. OK, so let's walk through it. Um, oh, I'll give you the answers. Uh, you want to discount risk-neutral cash flows after corporate taxes at the after-tax risk-free rate, not the pre-tax risk-free rate. And all the authorities just use the pre-tax rate without comment. The authorities include the classic textbook by Brealey, Myers, and Allen, who missed this point as well until the last edition. Uh, second, the debt capacity of a call equals lambda, which is to be the target debt ratio that we might, or the debt capacity ratio that we might apply to the underlying, times delta times the APV of the underlying. That's the option delta minus option leverage, which I'm, we're going to call D sub C for C, so call. And I'll I, hope, I hope I can explain why that's true. And third, since op option leverage is off balance sheet, if the firm keeps its overall leverage on target, then growth companies are going to appear to operate at very low debt ratios. Uh, declining companies will appear to operate at very high debt ratios. And observed debt ratios will vary all over the place um, as time passes. OK? So we'll look at an example. I'll show you a table of valuation errors by not using the tax-adjusted Black-Scholes Merton formulas. And uh, we'll, I'll give you some examples of how optional leverage would affect observed debt ratios. Now, in order to do this efficiently, we've got to make some assumptions. Uh, and I'm not saying these assumptions are perfectly realistic, but we need them to illustrate the points. The first thing I'm going to assume is rational valuation. 
We're not going to worry about agency or frictions or anything like that. And rational valuation implies that off-balance sheet debt counts as much as on-balance sheet debt. Second, consistent valuation. If we accept the standard practice for valuing capital investments or assets in place, what are the consistent procedures for valuing a real option? Third, um, the trade-off trade theory is not really assumed in the, first, in, the, in the answers to the first two questions, but it's a convenient assumption to illustrate what happens if you've got off-balance sheet debt, but you can't see it in the published financial statements. I'm not endorsing the trade-off theory. It's just a way of explaining what the implications are here. Okay? With me so far? All right. Oh, and I'm going to assume that there's a stable target debt ratio lambda for assets in place and for the underlying asset. Um, and so if you can think of it as a target debt ratio. Or in a capital budgeting context, you can think of it as the amount of debt that is attributed or assigned or imputed to the asset that you're going to buy. Okay? And I'm going to make lots of simplifying assumptions like, for example, that we know what the exercise price is and it's fixed. So uh, I'm going to work with a simple example. I'm not sure we need to go through absolutely every line of this, but uh, it's set up so that you have a one-period project uh, that gives you a certain equivalent cash flow of 106 and risk-free rate of 6%, tax rate of 35%, and a lambda 0.5. And down here, you can see the valuation formula. We discount the certainty equivalent at the risk-free rate. And then we add a term that picks up the interest tax yield on the debt that we impute or is supported by the asset. The interest tax yield is lambda, the target, times the interest rate, times the tax rate, times the APV itself, all discounted 1 plus R. And that formula collapses to uh, a certainly equivalent discounted at a tax-adjusted rate, and the tax-adjusted rate is just multiplied by 1 minus lambda T. Now, of course, if you're talking about an absolutely safe cash flow, lambda in that limit equals 1, and you just divide by the after-tax rate. Now, this formula, this uh, asset here is, uh, um, turns out to be worth 101. You could also calculate that APB by discounting the cash flows at an after-tax weighted average cost of capital, but I think it's clearer to break it out this way. Okay, now let's suppose we had a forward contract with a forward contract price of 100. And we are to assume that the asset now is worth 101, as is on the previous slide. Uh, we, so we know what the asset is worth, but what's the present value of that obligation to pay the forward price of 100? Well, it's a debt equivalent obligation. Um, and since it would be off-balance sheet debt, uh, we have to assume that it displaces regular debt dollar for dollar. Now, in order to account for the displacement of regular debt, we end up discounting the 100 at not the risk-free rate of 6%, but at an after-tax rate of 3.9%. Of so you can think of the going from just the present value of 100 at 6%, to the higher present value of 3.9% as an adjustment for the fact that there is implicit interest on the forward price and you're not getting to deduct it for tax purposes. In other words, you're displacing debt. The debt you're displacing has tax deductible interest, but the uh, obligation to pay the 100, there's no, the interest is there, but it's not tax deductible, so you have to make an adjustment. Now, this calculation here, I, I, know what, I know what some of you are thinking. I bet. I bet I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, well, why don't we just mark the forward contract to market? Well, in that case, we discount the 100 at the market rate of 
So what this calculation does is to say the present value of the forward contract held by the corporation equals the mark-to-market -market value minus an adjustment for the tax yields you're losing because the forward contract price displaces regular debt. So we're saying that there's a kind of a drag on the value of this forward contract because it has to be held by a corporation which uh, is taxable, which likes the fact that it gets to deduct interest on its explicit debt. And because the off-balance sheet debt ex displaces explicit debt, you've got a, you've got a cost. Now, I'm, if I can digress just for a second. If this were a bank, and you ask what this forward contract is worth, there would be an equivalent argument, although it wouldn't sound equivalent maybe to start. What a bank would probably say is, well, first of all, let's mark the market. But then they'd say, well, wait a minute. We have to put up some capital if we're going to hold this bank. And capital is equity, basically. And uh, we'd rather not put up the equity because unlike borrowing, it's not tax deductible. So it's an interesting thing that's not well explained in the paper, that uh, the way banks look at um, um, assets like forward contracts, they think of the default financing as debt, but then say, what happens if we have to put up some equity to back the position, capital to back the position? It, not, a non-financial corporation would say the default financing is equity, but the project will support some debt, and that will save us some taxes. If you think about it, they're saying exactly the same thing, but in a kind of mirror image way. Okay? So to make the point, I do understand that the value here is not marked to market. It's marked to market minus a cost. That's a tax cost. Now, whether that tax, how, how do I know that tax cost is important in practice? Um, well, in a way, I'm just looking at what corporations do when they value assets in place and say, well, let's take that practice and apply it here and see what it tells us. Okay? All right. Now, it's all downhill from here. So the, what happens with a forward is that it has a net debt capacity, in this case, of minus 45.75. The fact that you're going to get the asset since the debt ratio target is 50%, that contributes debt capacity equal to half the APV, current APV of the asset. But it displaces debt equal to 96.25, and so the net debt capacity is minus 45.75. And so if a company held this forward contract and it adjusted its explicit debt to account for the off-balance sheet debt, it would appear, it would operate below its overall target debt ratio, even though the actual target debt ratio, when you count both kinds of debt, is on, is on target. You with me, I hope? So we go to an option. It's the same idea. There's two pieces to the debt capacity. One is the debt capacity contributed by the underlying and another is the debt capacity subtracted by the option leverage. So all we've done here is to take the APV of a call option and break it into its, uh, its replicating portfolio pieces. We're not saying we literally replicate it, but any option can be expressed as a difference between a position on the underlying, delta times the underlying, minus some, some amount of debt. So we're expressing it that way. And then observing that the first piece contributes debt capacity, equal lambda times whatever the delta APV is, and the second piece subtracts it. Um, there is a sort of hidden question here, which is pretty difficult, as to whether the, the company that loaded up on call options would change its lambda. But for the moment, we simply observe that the APV, the underlying, would be perfectly correlated with uh, an ordinary asset. Suppose you had one asset and call option to buy another. The first piece of this would be, would be perfectly correlated with the asset you've already got, at least locally, 
therefore you'd think it would have the same debt capacity, the same lambda. The second piece is, of course, the option leverage. Okay? Now, I'm perfectly aware that you can't typically replicate real call options, but you can value them, and any valuation of a call option can be broken into those two pieces. So we set up a simple example here where it's this same asset worth 101 that we're going to value. And uh, you work out a, the binomial, you see the up and down probabilities. Um, you break the option value into the two pieces. You recognize that the option leverage is, uh, <coughs> is, a, is a debt. It really is a debt. But it's not, the interest on it is implicit and not tax deductible. Therefore, the option leverage is a bigger drag on the value of the firm than an, than an explicit debt would be. And it's the same thing. This is the mark-to-market -market value of the, of the, of the um, option minus this charge for the displacement of ordinary borrowing. Okay? And uh, the way this works out, the, uh, um, the option, I'm sorry, the first piece the first piece is just the debt capacity of the first piece, just 5.5, which is lambda, times the delta, times the value of the underlying, which is 101. The second piece is the option leverage, which turns out to be 42.78. So the overall debt capacity of the option would be minus 14.72. And uh, suppose you had a company that had one asset in place and one call on the same type of asset. What you'd observe is the APV of the assets that you've already got, that's the 101, plus the present value of the option. But on the other side, instead of seeing debt at 50-50, you'd see explicit debt at 35.78, which is the 50.5, 50 minus the net debt, debt capacity of the option is minus 1472. So it would look like this company was operating at about 30, a little bit less than 35%, even though underneath it, the company is exactly at 50%. Everybody's so quiet, I don't know. Usually, if everybody's quiet, it means they either understand everything or nothing, right? <laughs> but I'll keep going. Um, now, it turns out that uh, we did the binomial the long way, but it turns out there's a shortcut, which is that if you were to work in an after-tax binomial tree, all you've got to do is to set up your risk-neutral probabilities so that the expected return equals the after-tax rate. And then you get to where we just got in one step. The effect of moving to the after-tax risk rate in order to get the risk-neutral probabilities is to gross up the option leverage and make it more expensive because of this tax effect. And similarly, if we go to the Black-Scholes-Merton formula, you just easy thing to do is just change it to the after-tax rate, put the after-tax rate in instead of the pre-tax rate. It all runs through. Okay, so the valuation summary. For, remember, I'm trying to do consistent, we are trying to do consistent valuation, valuation that's consistent with the way that capital investment decisions are routine, routinely made in practice. The value of the underlying has to be an APV, that is the tax adjusted present value. We discount the risk neutral after tax cash codes at the after tax risk free rate. And if you're using Black Scholes Merton, you just use the APV of the underlying not the mark-to-market -market value, and use an after-tax risk free rate, and you're done. Okay? Now, does it matter? Well, here's a table of the valuation errors that you get if you were working with a simple call option, ordinary call option, and use Black-Scholes-Merton without these tax adjustments. You forgot about what I just said. And, um, what are the errors? Well, let's take this one right here. You have an option that's at the money. The correct 
option value in this instance is 5.62, the uh, forgetting about these tax adjustments would give you a value that's 1.46 higher, which is a fractional error of 26%. And you can see going across that uh, when the option is out of the money, the absolute errors are smaller, but the percentage errors are bigger. As you go to options that are in the money, the absolute errors are larger, but the percentage errors are smaller. And this is systematic. This is what you always see when you run these kinds of examples. OK? Now, let's go back to the debt, net debt capacity of calls and puts. For calls, which are growth options, the net debt capacity is always less than the underlying real asset and almost always negative, although if the call is far enough in the money so that the probability of exercise becomes very high, the net debt capacity of a call can turn positive. But if that doesn't usually happen in the, natural, in the kinds of examples that you naturally would do. For puts, you turn it around, and the debt capacity of a put is always greater than the underlying asset and always positive. Okay? And um, now, here's something that uh, Jamie and I found found interesting. Um, let's suppose that we take a, an in-the-money call and see what happens to the debt capacity as time passes and approaches maturity. And in this example, I'm going to assume that the underlying is always worth 125. In other words, it doesn't move around. It just stays at 125. And what happens here is that the net debt capacity um, I'm sorry, the option value goes to 25 because, of course, 25 minus 100. The debt capacity of the underlying goes to 37.50, which is, which is uh, what do we say here? What lambda are we assuming here, Jamie? Must, must be 30%. Um, and uh, the option leverage, however, look at the third line there, starts out with five periods to go at minus 62. But of course, at the instant before exercise, the option leverage is 100, because that's the amount you've got to pay. OK? The instant after exercise, you paid it, so the option leverage is gone. Now, the bottom line shows you the debt capacity uh, net of the option. And just look at what happens the instant before and the instant after exercise. The debt capacity goes from minus 67, my, sorry, minus 62.50 to plus 37.50 equals 100. So by paying the exercise price, you eliminate that amount of off balance sheet debt. And if you want, you can put on balance sheet debt back in. The implication here is that uh, if you take a company that is following a uh, 35 are we assuming 35 here, 30%? I forget. I'm sorry, I forget the lambda in this example. But it's following a strict target debt policy, but accounting for off and on balance sheet. And the implication here is that such a company can always, find, always finance capital investment with debt. And the reason is that exercise eliminates the debt, and you can just put it on the balance sheet. That's sort of interesting, isn't it? You have a company that may be operating in a conservative debt ratio, but finds it prudent to just finance every capital invest, every exercise of a call option with debt. OK, let me keep moving. Um, now, it comes up, then, it, then you get to this interesting question. Is option leverage really off balance sheet debt? Well, it's not exactly the kind of debt you normally think about because there's no claim by an outside lender and a failure to exercise not an event of default. And so, if, but if you're tempted to say, oh, this isn't really debt, slow down, because uh, option leverage is really like a collateralized non-recourse loan, right? There's no recourse if you don't exercise the option, but you lose the collateral, which is the value of the asset. 
And if you were thinking of a project financed with, with collateralized off balance sheet loan, you'd say, well, look, it's still, it's still a loan. It still adds financial risk. Defaulting is costly because you lose the, uh, you lose the present value of the, um, of the collateral. So maybe it isn't garden variety debt, but it sure is debt, I think. It adds financial risk. It creates the same kind of debt overhang problems that ordinary debt would. Matter of fact, this is the debt overhang problem that uh, I talked about all those years ago. So although I will admit that uh, if we really try to set up a model to calculate the optimal lambda for this kind of debt, or for a company that had a lot of this kind of debt versus a company that had a lot of regular debt, I'm not 100% sure that we come out in the same place, but I can tell you that it's complicated. We've tried to think it through, and there's no, aside from building a much more elaborate model of what happens in default, uh, it's not obvious which way it goes. It's not obvious that the lambda should be lower for this kind of debt than something else. Okay, let's move quickly on. Um, now, let's assume for purposes of discussion that the trade-off theory is right, that there's some kind of meaningful target debt ratio for the company as a whole. And we've got rational valuation, so off-balance sheet debt counts as on-balance sheet debt. Um, uh, oh, I'm sorry, I covered this already. Um, what would we observe? Well, the trade-off theory in its simple form makes two predictions. One, it says cross-sectionally that observed debt ratios equal target debt ratios on average, and then we can fix start thinking about what the target debt ratios ought to depend upon. Or in a time series, it says that observed debt ratios will fluctuate, but they'll tend to revert to the target. And suppose that is true for purposes of our illustration. Then uh, what you're going to observe is something that doesn't look like a, a, a trade-off theory at all. In this particular example, we've got one asset in place and a call option to buy another in year three. And um, the company in the, in the top panel has a firm target debt ratio of 25%. The observed debt ratios uh, look like this as the option becomes more and more in the money and actually go negative. So it would be prudent for this company, in this case with a very valuable asset, to operate at what appears to be negative leverage, that is zero debt and positive cash. Uh, the, the, the effects at a higher debt ratio are perhaps not as dramatic, but you can see how they go down. And we've tried this, uh, we've tried this experiment with all sorts of so apparently more realistic setups. It's always the same pattern. Okay, now just to conclude, you can see where this goes. When, when people go out and t try to test capital structure theories, they typically run the tests on thousands of firms, because after all, you can download CompuStat. How many firms are there on CompuStat? 5,000 or something? I don't know. And, um, and then they try to look at observed debt rates either over time or in a cross-section and see whether they can make sense of them. But in those thousands of firms, there are growth firms that have a lot of uh, call options a lot of real call options. There's also mature firms that have a lot of real put options. And we know that if those companies are acting the way it's assumed here, that their debt ratios are going to look very different than what their target lambda actually is. Um, and we go through, in the paper, we go through uh, um, all, the, all, all the implications. There's one down at the bottom that, uh, number six, that we found particularly interesting. Um, a lot of people, in, including uh, Stuart Turnbull and I way back in the 70s, had the idea that firms, growth firms, have valuable call options. And because call options are riskier than assets in place, we would expect that growth firms would have higher betas and higher standard deviations for that reason. Um, and other people have made that same observation. The answer is no. Because if the firm operates to keep its actual debt ratio at target, counting the option leverage as well as the explicit debt, uh, 
then uh, the, the risk does not change. Right? Because the overall debt ratio is constant, even though the observed debt ratio is not. So if you wouldn't really believe this theory, and I'm not saying that I do, you would not predict that growth firms have higher standard deviations or betas because the firms would be adjusting their capital structure to get back to the same level of volatility as if they only held assets in place. Okay? All right. Now, um, A minute more, maybe. Um, so what does this mean for all these theories of capital structure that I've been working on ever since I started as a doctoral student? Uh, well, in particular, what does it mean for this trade-off theory? Trade-off theory, I'm, I'm going to brag a little bit, was invented by Alex Robichek and me back in the late 60s. And just the idea that there's, both cost, there's a tax benefit of borrowing money, there's cost of borrowing too much, there's therefore uh, some kind of optimal leverage ratio that you shoot for. And nowadays, I don't really believe that theory. But nevertheless, it's a kind of a benchmark theory that we like to look at, even if we, only, even if we want to reject it in the end. Um, we, the, typically, tests are done on firms that have a lot of real options. Okay. And if we think of the real options, it can explain a lot of things very easily. Explain why growth firms don't borrow very much. Ah, oh, is that good for the news for the theory? Well, not really, because this gets so complicated. That is, the kinds of behavior, the kinds of patterns you see in corporate borrowing, which might be, which probably are generated by these kinds of off-balance sheet option leverage. They're complicated enough that I don't know how you reject the theory. In that case, what good is the theory? Huh? So is it good news or bad news? I think on balance for the theory, it's bad news. But um, the possible way out of the problem is to do the tests on mature companies which plausibly don't have many real options. And then all these complicated complications might, um, I won't so go, go away, but might uh, mess things up less. OK, thanks. <laughs> you want a question? You want to take any questions? Okay. Peter? Yeah. Um, um, still. Um, I thought there's another implication of what you're proposing, and that is really an additional rationale for mergers, because you have the same growth opportunity that's valued differently by different firms, partly on account of different effective tax rates, and partly because of different mixes of on-balance sheet and implicit on off-balance sheet uh, leverage. Well, I, I understand that if the tax situations were different, that would make a difference in these calculations. Yeah, that would. That's what's, one the, thing. what's the second? The other one is the, the fact that you have different levels of on balance sheet and all off balance sheet leverage for the two firms. Well, why would that make it? Why would you? I thought in your calculations, you will take into account the mix of on balance sheet, on balance sheet, and off line. So if that, if that is different, the valuations will be different. Oh, so you want, you want to merge companies so that the balance sheets will look better? Yes. Okay. And that would change the valuation. And that's another rationale for mergers creating additional value. Okay. Stu, thank you very much. I'm not sure I understood 100% of the math, but um, conceptually, I, I couldn't help wondering how analogous this uh, is to uh, Fisher Black's uh, analysis of uh, under, underfunded defined benefit plans and the uh, benefit of using on balance sheet debt to fully fund them to get the tax shield. So in other words, for mature companies viewing that uh, underfunded DB plans are um, sort of functionally similar to real options 
if you think that debt is the same as uh, you know, senior debt of the, of, the, of, the, of the company. Oh, well, that, that's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. Uh, uh, Fisher's argument was just that it's a tax arbitrage. That right. Why not borrow on your balance sheet, deduct the interest, and then get uh, tax-free inside buildup inside the pension? And that, that, of course, is a very powerful thing. Um, there's a related question of whether the market recognizes the off-balance sheet liability of an underfunded pension. Bob and Lee, Lee, uh, Lee Jin and is the third author? Is it e? V. E. E. Yeah. says that they've market, the market see it. Uh, but that, that, that line of argument would be similar because if a corporation understood its pension liabilities and was trying to balance, get the lambda right, so to speak, it would borrow less on its balance sheet, which is the opposite of what Fisher was saying. But Fish Fisher would say, well, if the market knows what's going on, it'd be a great thing to borrow and then, and then put the money in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the analogy that I think is a close one is that by ignoring an off-balance sheet item, when you, if you're just working with the balance sheet numbers, you're going to get results that are misleading. So in that sense, it's very similar. Yeah. Yep. Have you talked about the, uh, I agree with some of the, I, some of the questions about arbitrage, you have to worry about that in the paper and see who's the right clientele for this is partially what was asked before. But have you talked about the dynamics of this? In other words, as the company realizes the growth opportunities and you get results, then exactly what that would imply that you would expect empirically to see? You know, that's one question I had. And then the other part of the question is, what if there's success or what if there's failure of these options? What are the tax implications at that time? And are they differential versus the firm that just issues debt? Yeah, I, that is, the latter question is a bit of a hole here, which I don't know what to do about, because we don't ask what it costs to, to buy the real option which uh, would be an investment or an expense. We just assume they've got it. And if you're tracking the company through time and it was buying options or disposing of them, uh, there'd be tax consequences of that, which it, I admit not in here. The, uh, there is one interesting thing in the time series, which, which uh, I don't know whether this is a, a result we can prove algebraically or whether it's just a very strong tendency, but if you, uh, track the firm through time with some assumed mix of options and underlying assets, and then ask, what if there's a positive shock? Uh, in all cases, or maybe almost all cases, I've, I've forgotten, the observed debt ratio go down. So you have positive news, which you would think increases debt capacity, but the observed debt ratio goes down, which takes you back to this paper by Evo Welch that I love in the J JPE that it seems to show that uh, when companies get good news, which in its old-fashioned view would say, well, now they have more debt capacity. In fact, they borrow, borrow less and move more to equity and, and the converse when they have bad news. And this could explain that. As a matter of fact, it does generate that behavior. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stu.